Hi, this is Amanda. And this is Lindsay. We're True Creeps. Where the stories are true. And the creeps are real. We'll cover stories from grotesque gore. To the possibly plausible paranormal. To horrifying history. To tense and terrible true crime. And everything else that goes bump in the night. We want you to join us while we creep. We cover mature topics. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our sixth episode of True Crime Digest. Can you believe it's been, this is our sixth one? Right, we've been doing this for six months already. I mean, I can't believe we're, we're what, at like 10 months of podcasts by the time this has been released? I know. It's almost our birthday. It is almost our birthday. I am very excited about that. So today we are going to talk about some new cases. And then we're going to come back to some updates on cases that we already covered before. We're also saving some Valo updates for last. And also, remember to stick around until the end. We are going to discuss our Patreon. Special quick thank you to all of our current patrons. Yeah, we appreciate you so, so much. And we're glad you're loving this show. Yeah, and I was actually getting ready to send out some stickers to some of our new patrons. So remember, if you just signed up, look in the mail in a couple weeks and you're going to have some stickers. Yeah. So the first case that we're going to talk about is the missing persons case for Daniel Robinson. And that's out of Arizona. So it's actually where he disappeared is only about 30 minutes from where I am. So this has been on the news a lot. So who is Daniel? He moved to Arizona from South Carolina for his first job in 2019. He's only 24 years old, and he worked as a field geologist, which is a really cool job for a 24-year-old. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. You don't hear that very often. So he is 5'8", between 150 to 165 pounds. He has black hair, dark brown eyes, and he was born without part of his right arm. So he's missing the part from like his right forearm down. So including his hand. Daniel's older brother, his name's David, he was just talking about him and said whatever he could do to lift someone's spirit, he always was there to help them going through a hard time. And just everything I've read about Daniel sounds like he's a wonderful person. Yeah. He's been known to go to the beach or the mountains for his brother and that he was making more trips than he typically did. Which, to be honest, as someone from Arizona, and if he's working in Arizona, right now is the time that you leave Arizona because it's very hot. And then between like monsoons and stuff, it's humid too. It's not a good place to be right now. So yes, I'm all for it doing the trips. It's not abnormal to me. From what you've told me, there's about two months out of the year where you don't want to leave Arizona. Yeah. Yeah. Like December and January are great. They're great months. What are the temps like there during those months? Uh, Bearable. It, it's a little cool. I don't want to say cold because people are going to make fun of me. It's not cold. <laughs> <laughs> but like you definitely could get away with like wearing a cardigan for some of the day. Oh, man. I need full on hoodie weather. I do. Yeah. Sometimes we get hoodie weather. Sometimes. I do remember a few fairly cold Thanksgivings and Christmases, but also I don't think last year was very cold at all. I don't even think I got to wear some of my hoodies last year. By fairly cold, do you mean like it's like 80 or, or what? <laughs> yeah. Like is it? A chilly 80 degree weather day. <laughs> yeah. A brisk 80. <laughs> You know what's funny is that's kind of like a meme that Arizona shares a lot is like if the weather goes down below 80 at all, like it'll be like 79 and there'll be people like bringing coats. <laughs> it's stupid. Anyway, but what I'm trying to say is I, I understand why he might want to leave here and go to the beach. Yeah, because I too did that last week. I get it. He usually communicated with his family, so it was abnormal for him not to and just to take off. You know, he'd, he'd talk about where he was going, what he was doing. Yeah. His job required that he oversee work sites in remote desert locations, which is from where he disappeared. It's pretty remote. There's often extreme conditions to where he'd work. So you would think he'd have, you know, some training and things to do in what if situations. Yeah. He also traveled long distances to work on projects, which, okay, a geologist, that makes sense. Yeah. So on June 23rd of this year, 2021, he left his job site in the desert area west of Sun Valley Parkway in Buckeye, Arizona, and he wasn't seen again. And the particular job site was at Sun Valley Parkway and Cactus Road. Now, when he left, he didn't tell his coworkers where he was going or why he was leaving. That's probably out of the ordinary if you have to like check in or check out of a job. 
But I haven't seen a lot of details for this specific work site. But in my head, as like a safety measure, when there's a group working in the desert, whether it be like construction workers or whatever it may be, I would think that they'd have some sort of like sign in, sign out process just in case because, yeah, the weather conditions are terrible. So from what I looked at, what his particular job function was, was he was testing, I want to think it was water because he was technically like a hydrogeologist. So it could be that he had a very specific job on that site and then he left. Or, I mean, I would imagine like if you're part of like a construction crew, that's one thing versus like the scientists on staff, I would imagine that they probably aren't like as monitored, but I don't know. I don't know like desert conditions. (laughs) So like it would make sense like if people could go missing that you might want to have an idea. Well, I would think, yeah, if they're in the middle of like a remote area, whether it be here or somewhere else, Mm -hmm. that just keeping track of your employees It kind of falls on, you know, the company too. So they'd want to be extra safe, you would think. Mm, I don't think so. Because like if you leave for lunch, you know, or to go take a drive. Yeah, but normally you like clock out or have something on paper that you're gone, I would think, for safety purposes. I don't know. Because then, like, if there was, let's say, an emergency, I mean, what if there was one of the wildfires or something that came up? Wouldn't you want to go, okay, we should have eight people right now. So-and-so's on lunch. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. I don't live in a place where there's wildfires. So the idea of that, I'm like, oh, why would you need to know where people are? Well, also it's, you know, 115 degrees or more that if someone were to pass out while working or if they left for the day and they didn't account for someone being out in the middle of the desert, I feel like that's a safety hazard. Yeah, that's true. So on the same day that he left the job site, his family filed the missing persons report and they also created a website called Please Help Find Daniel. And I think that speaks volumes to the kind of person that he is because a lot of people would be like, oh, they could be X, Y, Z. It's not altogether strange, but like if you know your kid and you know it's strange for them to just walk away from work and not come back, Mm -hmm. you know your kid. And so his family has also created a GoFundMe site to help with search efforts. And his employer, Matrix New World Engineering, is the largest contributor so far. And they donated $2,500, which I thought was nice. Yeah. And I think the last time I looked at the GoFundMe earlier today, it was about half funded. It's at 20715 right now out of 40000 Nice. So his father left their home state of South Carolina to come to Arizona once he found out that Daniel was missing and he hasn't left. And he said, I'm not going to leave here until he is found. And that's what he told Inside Edition Digital, which makes sense, especially like if you know that this is not your kid, I'd stay too. Yeah. And something too that, I mean, we just talked about the GoFundMe. He's staying at a hotel. Like he's been there for a while in the hotel. So not only will the GoFundMe help with things like a private investigator, more flyers, search and rescue teams, things like that, it'll also help him pay for some of those expenses to be here so he can help with the search efforts and, you know, organize everything. Yeah. And he also plans to hire an attorney and a PI as well as a forensic specialist. Now, Daniel's older brother said, it's been really hard trying to keep going throughout the day. There isn't a whole lot we know about it. And I just can't even imagine how hard this would be for them. And Daniel's father said, I would like to emphasize that my son was not depressed. He was enjoying his life and excited about his future. He was not the type of guy to go anywhere without staying in touch with his family. And it is hurtful to us what some people have said. And I hate that as a parent, he has to go, no. Like, even if he was mentally ill, he's worth finding. Mm -hmm, For sure. But I hate that, like, there sometimes seems like people who are investigating are really quick to jump and go, what's the easiest way we can wrap this up? Yeah. And they'll say, like, this person was depressed or it looks like it was this. And then basically (laughs) just wash their hands of the whole situation. And I'm glad that his father is being a zealous advocate for him and saying, this isn't right. This isn't him. Something is wrong. Yeah, and I think we talked about it in the Kendrick Johnson episode that what you say online when a case is active, it's pretty likely that someone involved in the case, like a family member or a friend, is going to see that comment. So think before you comment. I mean, I feel like in any contemporary true crime case, family members are seeing it. It's interesting how people will speak as though they're talking about a celebrity, which celebrities, like, don't say mean things about anybody on the internet. Like, let's just, like, say that fully. But, like, celebrities, for the most part, have at least put themselves in that position. Whereas, like, a victim... No. Why are you saying mean things about victims? But anyway, so back to the search. They've been using helicopters and search and rescue dogs, but they've still been unable to find Daniel. So there was a new development on July 20th. 
and a rancher found his blue grayish 2017 Jeep Renegade on his property. It was about four miles southwest of where he had last been seen. And it appeared that it had tumbled down a ravine and landed on its side. Now, a couple things about the scene. The airbags were deployed. Police believe that he was wearing a seatbelt at the time of the crash because a computer within the car basically told them it was intact. So the computer itself functions similar to like a black box. Mm -hmm. They were able to find his cell, his wallet, some of his clothes, and keys at the crash site. I feel like one of the things that I kept looking for was a description as to whether those were his clothes that he was wearing that day or whether they were extra clothes. Yeah, this is what was weird about this. I, and I'm sure they're holding it back for reasons that we don't know. Yeah. But in a lot of other cases, it'll like list the things that he had or this is what he normally brings to work. This is what was found in the car. In this, it's very, very basic information that's being given out. I'm not sure why. It could be something. It could just be me reading into it a little too much. So as of right now, police say no foul play is suspected. And they're saying no foul play is suspected based on the way the car looks and what's in the car, mm -hmm. which makes me wonder if there were objects that would have been stolen if it was foul play. I would imagine he would have a work laptop, right? Maybe, yeah. Work laptop, something like that. Or if he had like cash in his wallet or something like that. But I think it's interesting that from what I saw, it was like no foul play is suspected based on how the car was found. Yeah. And I'm like, hmm, interesting. Yeah. And obviously when they found the car, he was not in the car. Over the weekend of July 24th, there was a search party that was organized to go out and leave from the Love's truck stop. However, because of weather, we actually had a monsoon that weekend. They had to postpone it. As of right now, on the website, the Search for Daniel website, there is no new scheduled search at this time. But if you are in the area, if you have the time, it says you can put your name and phone number and information down and you can volunteer to help look for Daniel. That's amazing. Yeah. When I've gone onto the website a couple times, that the grid that they have posted does look like it's being searched and there's different pieces being searched every time I refresh. So I assume there are still parties working on it. Yeah. So on top of all of this, there is a $10,000 reward being offered for information about Daniel's whereabouts. And if you do want to check out his information or anything in regards to his search, check out the searchfordaniel.org website. So, you know, when we research, we try to find everything from news to different theories, things like that. And on Web Sleuths, there was a theory saying that his body might have been washed away with the intense amounts of rain in the area if he had gotten out of the vehicle and died. And it did rain that weekend. And in Arizona, it's very strange the way monsoons happen. You can be in one area and then like 15 minutes away, nothing's happening in that area. So I don't know, you know, that specific area and what it looked like that particular day. But I don't believe it was raining around the time that the car was found. I think it was after. So in my opinion, I don't know if that theory so much holds up. I think that makes sense. I was like, I think it's kind of like armchair detectives, like hearing what the weather's like and then speculating. Yeah. And it, like it could be, it could have been that it rained a lot more over there and I just didn't know because it was sunny here. Yeah. So I don't know. But in this area and in the area where his car was found, it wouldn't surprise me to have a lot of flash floods when it does rain. And that's kind of a big thing to think about in Arizona, too. I don't know if you saw anything on the news there, Lindsay, but... I did not. It was so flooded here last weekend that people were getting their cars stuck. There's videos of people in boats going down the streets in certain areas. So it's a weird place. So you have weird heat. We have flooding. Like the other day, I don't know. I think I'm the 17th. I could be wrong. There was just like this like crazy storm and people were posting just like pictures and you would see like a road and like 20 feet ahead, it's like submerged and a car is like fully submerged. Yeah. And it actually looks like there's a piece of property that's in between my house and two family members' houses. And it looks like a tornado went through there. Just like, just touched down right there. Because it looks like a 50 to 100 year old tree was just uprooted. Yeah. Other trees were split in half. It's wild. But like, just random. Just a random storm. Yeah, we have things like that. I mean, the weekend that they were supposed to do the search for Daniel, we lost a big part of one of our trees just from the random wind. 
Yeah. So as far as this case goes, again, we kind of talked about how there's not a lot of details released for things like, was it normal for him to take a break at that time? Was it normal for him to like go to one of the truck stops or something to go get a snack or a coffee or whatever? Was there a sign out? Did he have to even alert anyone or was it usual for him to just get up and go and take a break? I wish that was answered just so you can start thinking about, okay, like what was going through his head at that time? When also, if you're going to abandon a vehicle and you're conscious, a lot of times you'll put like a white piece of fabric in like a window or something that like holds it there so that people know you're coming back to it. I don't know if you've ever seen that like on the side of the road. No. I haven't heard like official rule, but whenever I see cars that are like on the side of the road, I often, if they're like no one around them, I've often seen like a piece of fabric tucked in. Perhaps that's just a regional symbol for I'm coming back to this vehicle. I ran out of gas or whatever. But like, I wonder if there was like some indication that he was conscious when he left. Well, I know there were a few questions that I've even seen online. Like, was his seatbelt still attached? Was it unlocked? If he was conscious and he got up, when the first thing you would think of is, oh, let me grab my cell phone, especially in the middle of nowhere. Maybe it doesn't work here, but maybe, I don't know, a mile over, it might start working again. Or maybe he just knew the area and maybe he just knew it didn't work there. I don't know. As a person who lives in like a desert terrain, do you keep like excess water and stuff like that in your car as like an emergency? Like, I don't do that, but I also like, I live in a very populated place, so... I probably wouldn't have that issue likely. So that is something that you would do? Yeah, normally when we're going somewhere, especially during the summertime, we fill up one of our bigger water bottles to bring with us that, you know, you couldn't possibly drink in a full hour or whatever. It's like an all-day water bottle. Yeah. But we normally try to have something in the car. Not necessarily plastic water bottles because those like yeah. get weirdly melted and gross <laughs> because it gets really hot. Because you live in a place where plastic melts in your car. But I would imagine that if he was accustomed to working on job sites in deserts, he probably had some like container for water. Yeah. I would be interested to know whether that was missing. Yeah. I want to know a little bit about like his work site, the co-workers that he was working with. I mean, I'm sure going down a ravine, that's scary. He could have hit his head really hard. There's a lot of what ifs that could have happened. Yeah. And I mean, it looks like the area, they have it broken down into a grid. People are tirelessly working to try to find him, the GoFundMe, they have drones, all kinds of things going on right now. But again, like if you have the time to help, you can drop your information down on their website and it said that they would contact you and let you know the next time that they need you. So our next case, we're going to go in a fully different direction. And it starts with just some like basic good news. The dating game killer is dead. Hooray. So he died on July 24th of this year of natural cause causes at the Cochrane State Prison in California. He was 77 years old. So we're going to talk a little bit about him because I actually didn't know a whole ton about him. I knew what his name came from, but other than that, and I was like, oh, this is worse than I knew. But of course, like if he's infamous, there's a reason. So law enforcement estimates that he may have killed as many as 130 people across the U.S. So he was a photographer and he would lure people away offering to take their picture all of the people that he has been confirmed to kill were women or girls, but they suspect that he also may have had young men as his victims as well. And I'll talk about why in a moment, but he would strangle and sexually assault his victims. And so he would strangle people to like they passed out, resuscitate them, and then repeat. Oh, who's that sound like? That is like Samuel Little, who is America's most prolific serial killer in terms of victims that have been proven. So his name was Rodney Alcala. He's unimportant, right? So he was linked to murders in Los Angeles and Marin counties in California, Seattle, New York, New Hampshire, Arizona, Illinois, and California. He was known as the dating game killer because he once appeared on the dating game in 1979. And on that episode, the woman who was seeking her date her name was Cheryl and Alcala, after the show, came up and talked to her and asked her out. And I believe that he said something to the akin of like, I'll take you on a date you'll never forget. And she got a really weird feeling. And she said, I started to feel ill. He was acting really creepy. I turned down his offer. I didn't want to see him again. Now, it turns out that the dating game didn't really have a stringent background check because before appearing on the show, he had been on the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives list. It's terrifying. Right? So he had sexually assaulted and beat an eight-year-old girl named Tali Shapiro. So after that, he moved to New York City and lived under the alias John Berger. And he was recognized from his photo being on a wanted poster. And he was only sentenced to three years. 
Why? Because we're the worst. So he's then released from prison and then he sexually assaults and beats a 13 year old girl. And then he only spent two years in prison for this. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I hate it. Disgusting. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. So he also murdered four women and a 12 year old girl from 1977 to 1979 and was convicted of their murders in 2010 in Orange County. So he was matched to the victims using DNA. And some of his victims were Jill Barcombe, and she was 18. She was sexually assaulted, bludgeoned, strangled, and then dumped in the Hollywood Hills in November of 1977. Georgia Wickstead, she was 27, sexually assaulted, choked, beaten to death, and her attack was in her Malibu home in December of 1977. Charlotte Lamb, who was 32, she was sexually assaulted, strangled with a shoelace, and then she was found in the laundry room of her home in El Segundo in June of 1978. Jill Parento, she was 21, and she was found in her apartment in Burbank after she had been strangled in June of 1979. And then Robin Samso, she was only 12 years old, and her body was found in the foothills of Sierra Madre days after she disappeared from Huntington Beach Pier in June of 1979. She was on her way to ballet class, and Robin and her friends had been approached by a man asking if they wanted their photo taken. A sketch artist drew the man that they had described, and Alcala's per- role officer recognized him. You know what's weird is I'm pretty sure maybe it was a TikTok or a video I've seen recently. There is someone going around right now asking if they can take people's pictures and like making them beautiful and giving it to them. But like after reading this, that just sounds terrifying. Oh yeah. There's tons of people on TikTok. There's one guy who like, he like has them do weird things and it looks like they're like breathing fire. But like he is not the first killer who has been like, I could take some photos of you. Yeah. So investigators in Seattle found hundreds of photos when they were investigating Robin Samso's murder in 1979. There were women, girls, and boys. There were jewelry that they had suspected might have been trophies from other victims. Some sources say it was earrings specifically, and at the site, they found Robin Samso's earrings. Her mother testified at the trial that the one pair of earrings that was recovered was indeed Robin's. But a clip of him from the dating game shows him wearing the earrings a full year before Robin died. Yeah. I mean, it's not impossible for the same earrings to be in different places. It's not. And like, from what I understand, they were like little gold studs. Now, the photos were released in 2010 by the Huntington Beach Police Department because they wanted to see if anyone in the photos would come forward to say whether they had been attacked or say somebody in the photos was missing. Yeah. And my immediate reaction, right, because to this was, we have a list of states, Texas Killing Field. I immediately began looking through the photos to see if any of them matched. And I want you to tell me what you think of whether the following could be Michelle Garvey. Ooh, okay. Because the photos of Michelle Garvey, we have one and then we have an age progression photo that doesn't look very human. It's a drawing, right? It's not of her. Right. And so I'm pulling this up really quick because this one shows up in like all of them. So follow me here because I'm going to show you Michelle Garvey first. And this looks like a picture to me of when she was younger. Okay. Yeah. So like red hair, light eyebrows. To me in this photo, she doesn't look more than like 12, right? Yeah. Fair. Mm -hmm. And I know that, right, looking at her, it looks like just red hair, but then, like, you kind of look a little bit closer and you see it looks like a more grown-up Michelle Garvey to me. Yeah, put them side by side for a sec. I literally stared at these photos for, like, a good while last night, just, like, being like, am I going crazy? So I feel like the nose. The nose? Yeah, the nose. It's hard to tell because, like, her lips look really thin as a child, but you can't really judge it that much. Mm -mm, But the face shape? Mm -hmm. Even the shade of red specifically, like her eyebrow area looks like. Yeah, and like the very light eyebrows in both pictures. Yeah, and like that's also, I feel like, a trait of gingers. You know what I mean? So it's how much is it like being a red-haired woman versus like, is that this person? Well, the eye color too. Yes, the eye color is similar looking to me. And so that kind of gave me a little bit of chills because like I saw her photo and I was like, oh, I recognize her. And then I went and looked for Michelle Garvey's picture because I was like, who was the one? Because she went and just as a refresher, Michelle Garvey was the one from Texas Killing Field who she snuck out of her home in Connecticut. She was 15. Then she shows up a month later dead in Texas. 
So I don't think this is completely out of the realm of possibility. And she'd also been strangled. So it fits the dating game killer at 15. I mean, that doesn't look like a 15 year old to me, though. That looks a little bit older. I think that she does look a little bit older, but I also like want you to keep in mind, right, that like in the eyes, she has like some bags, but like she looks tired to me in this photo, not necessarily older. Maybe. I don't know. No, I, I could definitely see the similarities. Yeah. But I was just like, oh, perhaps. And so the photos that have been released, there's hundreds of them and you can find them online and we'll post a link as well. But it's interesting because you're seeing people like in the 70s. But I don't know. When I look at like photos from the 90s, I'm like, this is really grainy. But the photos are like really, really crisp because he was a photographer. So it's like nice photos of people. It's a photo taken in the 70s that's better than like what we see in the 90s. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, but weird. So during one of his trials, the prosecutor, Matt Murphy, said, you're talking about a guy who's hunting through Southern California looking for people to kill because he enjoys it. So after he had been convicted in California, he was extradited to New York. He pled guilty and was sentenced to 25 years to life for the murders of Ellen Jane Hover and Cornelia Crilly, which were also during the 1970s. In 2016, Alcala was charged with the murder of 28-year-old Christine Ruth Thornton in Wyoming. She had disappeared in 1978, but her remains weren't found until 1982. She was six months pregnant at the time of her disappearance. Alcala wasn't extradited, though, because he was in poor health. Which, that's disgusting. But he was all over the country murdering people in the 70s. A very busy man and disgusting. And so, again, as we mentioned, he died on the 24th of July. So the world is a little bit better. Yeah, that's awful. Mm -hmm. Super awful. The next case that we're going to talk about is the Hollywood Ripper. And I can't imagine why you were interested in this, Lindsay. Because I am deeply interested in Jack the Ripper. You know this, but they don't know this. So that's why I had to say it. Yeah, we've talked about it several times. Have we? They should know this. We need to do like a trivia night. Oh God. How well do you know us? <laughs> and all the weird things we mentioned. <laughs> I hope that one day you become a scientist of something. I'm a sticker scientist. Okay, that's fair. I, can, I feel comfortable as a sticker scientist. <laughs> I want you to talk about the mechanics of like the glue in a sticker or something soon. Why? Why are you doing this to me? Because I want you to prove your scientific methods. I could prove that I can make a good sticker. How about that? I want you to get real sciencey about it. The adhesives. Yeah. Anyway, back to the Hollywood Ripper. Thank you. So the Hollywood Ripper, his name was Michael Gargiulo, and he was 45. He was known as the Hollywood Ripper, the Chiller Killer, and the Boy Next Door Killer because he lived next to the women that he stalked and then killed. He worked as an HVAC repairman, a bouncer, and he was an aspiring actor. He was convicted in August of 2020. He was sentenced to death on July 16th of this year for the murder of two women and the attempted murder of another woman. One of the victims was supposed to go on a date with Ashton Kutcher. Do you remember? I remember that being in the news. I did not remember being in the news. And when I saw this, I was scrolling down and I was like, that detective looks like Ashton Kutcher. And then when I was reading it, I was like, oh, that's just Ashton Kutcher with a really handsome mustache. Yeah, I remember, I think his picture was along with it, like as the clickbait for this when it was first being talked about. And I, I do remember hearing about him testifying at the trial too. Yeah. He was a friendly neighbor who did handyman work for his neighbors before he broke in and then would kill them. Wow, what a gem. And this terrible, awful human being maintained his innocence. So he murdered women in both California and Illinois. His first victim in California was Ashley Ellerin, and she was just 22 years old, and she was a fashion designer. And she's the one who was supposed to go on a date with Ashton Kutcher. And so when she didn't show up, he went to her house, and he knocked, and he just, like, looked through the window because it was there. Mm -hmm. And he saw red liquid on the floor, and it turned out that that was actually her blood, and she had already been murdered. It's so awful. Yeah. Gargiulo had stabbed her 47 times. Prosecutors alleged that the reason why he murdered Ashley was because he was jealous of her relationship with Ashton Kutcher or that it was like starting. And then her father had visited her just hours before she was murdered. Oh, her poor father. Yeah, very, very sad. What a terrible human being. Agreed. So in 2005, he murdered Maria Bruno, who was 32. She was a mother of four. After he had murdered her, he cut her breasts off and he removed her implants. He was a sick fuck, for sure. Then in 2006, 
He attacked Michelle Murphy in her home. She had fought back and injured him. And so when he left, he actually left a trail of blood. And that's how police found him. So great. But Michelle Murphy, although having survived this, she still says it's hard for her to like spend the night by herself. Understandable. Because she's like so scared, which is, you know, of course. So in Illinois in 1993, when he was just 17 years old, he murdered 18-year-old Trisha Picaccio. He stabbed her at her doorstep when she had come home from a night with friends. Now, I think an interesting and disgusting wrinkle to this is that he was a friend of her family's. He had been in her house. He knew her. So he wasn't just some stranger. This was someone he knew. Yeah. So truly, truly disgusting. Just awful. Yeah. What a terrible human being. Truly. So another ongoing investigation that we're going to cover is the dismembered body parts that have been found around Minneapolis. Oh, just casually body parts being found around Minneapolis. And we actually found out about this case from my brother who just texted me the name. And I was like, okay, dismemberment? Like with a question mark was what I sent back to him. Well, thanks, Chris. It was a very interesting case. Yeah. So, like I said, during the month of June of this year, there have been body parts found all over Minneapolis, not just in one location, in multiple locations. The first body parts were found on Thursday, June 17th, in two locations. The first discovery was made by a passerby along the 300 block of Main Street around 9.30 in the morning. Then, a short time after that, the second discovery was made, literally while the first discovery was still being investigated. Like, the investigators were still at the scene, and then there's another call like, hey, there's body parts here. The second discovery was found near the intersection of 3rd Avenue Northeast and University Avenue, which is about two blocks away from the first discovery. In some articles, I couldn't find specifics that were found, but there was like this one that listed it that said the first discovery was parts of a leg that had been cut into pieces and that were found on a patch of grass. Then the second area had an just unspecified body parts that were found inside a bag next to a parked SUV. I've also seen in some places, though, that they were multiple bags. So I'm a little unsure of what they were contained in and if they were even contained in that first one. This is only proving my theory that every trash bag out in the world is body parts until proven otherwise. It's terrifying. Yeah, like you definitely look at things different. Also, like if that was your family member. Yeah, his family and we're going to talk about it, but he also has kids. Yeah. So it's just awful. They use cadaver dogs and they search the area where the first two discoveries were made, hoping to find the rest of the body. But unfortunately, they were unsuccessful. The following day, it was determined that the body parts belonged to Adam Richard Johnson, who was 36 years old. The information was given during a news conference with John Elder, who's the director of police information for the Minneapolis PD. And when he gave this specific conference, it was Friday evening, so the following day in the evening. But he had already done two, I want to say, the same day that the parts were found. But this one just had a little bit more information because they had a full day to try to figure out what was going on. Yeah, I'm sure everyone was a flutter. Oh, yeah. So at the end, he did take questions afterwards, which I was surprised because most of the time when it's a case like this, they're like, no questions, like, gotta go. But he did take a few. I would imagine that's because it was probably a public panic. Oh, yeah, for sure. They're like, um, what is happening in our city? So when he took the questions, someone asked, were all the body parts included? And he had to discuss, no. Mm. Then one person's like, well, was the head there? And he's like, I'm not at liberty to discuss this. He also discussed the state of the body parts being a recent homicide because the person asked like, okay, like, were they frozen? Were they like in formaldehyde? Like, what was it? And he just said, no, we, we believe it was a recent homicide. And then also there's some articles saying like when he said that, it means, you know, it wasn't, I don't want to say just, but like it wasn't just like a finger where the person could still be alive. It is like significant body parts where this person is deceased. Well, like parts of a leg. Yeah, like you could still live through it, technically. Like we've seen that with Ant Hill kids, if they found pieces of her arm. Well, but they can also tell whether a body part was removed while the person was alive or dead. Yeah. So actually, it could be like a non-vital part, just they can tell whether it was cut post or pre-mortem. Yeah. And I don't think that that question has been answered yet either. So someone did ask, like, is this an isolated case or do we need to worry? And his response was, there's zero reason to believe that this is some type of pattern because it didn't match other cases in any other department that he could find 
find there's no similarities to other cases, nothing that he knew about. He also said, like, this case sticks with you. So, like, when he's talking to other departments and stuff, it would be one that someone would remember if it had happened before this. We've talked about VICAP before, too, where they log different, like, factors about a case. But sometimes the public is VICAP, right? We're all going to remember the last time that we found body pieces, right? Like, that's not going to just leave the public sphere. Yeah. And then he also did say, too, like, it appeared to be a very focused attack. So it doesn't appear that it was, like, random. It wasn't, like, a random person off the street that they decided to do this to. They were going after him for some reason. And then there was a question like, did the victim have a background at all? And his answer was, quote, it is a person we would have been familiar with. So the police department knew of him. That's a very political way of saying that, by the way. It is. Yeah. Here's the thing, though. You know what I don't care about? Whether he had a background. Oh, no, not at all. I don't care. People always kind of like gauge like, how much should I care about this human being? Yeah. And like, that's one of the boxes that people tick and go, okay, I can be less concerned. Right, right. I think he was trying. Yeah, not him, the question asker. Make the public, yeah, yeah, the public feel better in, in the sense of, I will answer your questions and I'm not holding anything back because if he had held something back, then they'd be like, oh no, what is this? Or yeah, I don't know. I think he was trying his best. So the authorities also believed the death was recent because of the state of decomposition on the pieces. And also, just something to note, there was no missing persons report that had been filed for Adam. Interesting. Yeah, it's hard to tell how long he had been missing. You know, if he was missing, did it happen that night? We don't know. Then on June 22nd, just before 7 a.m., someone found a human head placed on a park bench at the West River Parkway in East Franklin Avenue, which is three miles away from the first location. Can you imagine? Having logged so many episodes of Criminal Minds, this seems like not a person who is out to kill one person. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like the first time you kill someone, you're not like, let me display their head, right? Well, if we're going to criminal minds it, isn't it that they're trying to like make a show of it? Mm -hmm. Like, look what I did to this person. And normally, isn't it like more, what do they say, more rage in a certain person? Like that's their person that they were going after. So they're going to have more rage or more like theatrics with this person. I don't remember, but I don't feel like, like, okay, you're going to murder someone. Like, specifically, right? You've watched the true crime documentaries. We've researched. You have ways of doing it. You've thought this out. Would your first response be to make a big news fuss about the body being found? Like, that feels like a theatrical, dramatic way of... Like a finale? No, like disposing of a corpse. It seems like a person who's experienced with killing, right? Yeah. It's your first person you've killed. Like, you've either been planning it for a while, or you're experienced enough to know how to do this undetected, at least for a little while. And this is like a big thing to do. Like, it's not easy to tear apart a body either. It's also not easy to, like, go to a place and sit a human head there. No, no. Right? Like, think about how hard that would be. I mean, okay, maybe not in Arizona where everything's all remote and such. But, like, here, there is no place I would be comfortable leaving a head. Yeah. So this person had a lot of confidence. Yeah. Unfortunately. I'm going to say it's a white man between the ages of 24 and 50. Five. And he's a sexual sadist? Mm, there's nothing to show that he's a sexual sadist. No, but I think that they say that about like every killer in Criminal Minds. They do. It's all about sex here. I thought we were just playing Criminal Minds for a minute. Now let's fast forward to July of 2021. So just this last month, there were body parts found in the Mississippi River. And it was near the old Pillsbury Mill, which is close to the Stone Arch Bridge. Sheriff's officials and Minneapolis Police Department are now investigating whether the remains found in July also belong to Adam. I haven't seen any updates yet. I think they're still testing and doing things. But something that caught my attention is police did say there's no evidence of a second victim. So that leads me to believe that it was Adam. I feel like if there was a second victim, they wouldn't have been confident in saying that, right? Yeah. I feel like no one's family deserves to get their loved one remains back in this manner. No. It's grotesque. The only thing it reminds me of even a little bit is remember how Tim Miller for his daughter, Laura, kept getting more pieces back? They were like, oh, we found a box. And he's like, I'm sorry, what? That's a police failing. And this is clearly like a murderer. But the idea of like getting your loved one back piece by piece is appalling. No one should have to go through that. That's absolutely disgusting. No. So as of this moment, which today is July 27th, there's no cause of death 
determined and no arrests have been made. So we're going to talk a little bit about the victim, Adam Richard Johnson. Adam loved his family and spending time with his kids. His family said he suffered from mental health and addiction issues, and they're currently collecting money to put towards a reward money fund, and they're working with authorities. They also have a GoFundMe page for him as well, and that's also for his funeral and burial. There's nothing in his history that suggests he was connected with any type of organized crime. The mother of Adam's child also spoke to the media. She doesn't know why Adam would have been in the part of Minneapolis where part of his remains were found, and she didn't know anyone that would want to hurt him. She discussed having to tell their four-year-old son that he wasn't going to see his dad again. It made me so sad. The only silver lining here is that he's just four, right? Because like any older and he might understand what's happening. You know what I mean? So when my son was four, we had to put down, and this is in no way the same thing. I mean, in my heart, I care about my dogs just as much, but we had to put a dog down. And explaining that to him was one of the hardest things I've had to do in my life at four. Yeah. I can't imagine this conversation. No. And like, how do you decide like what to say? What's too much? What's too little? Because, Mm -mm. you know, I feel like you always hear stories of little like asshole kids being like, your dad, da 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 da. And like him hearing it from like a playmate, right? Because one of their parents like said something too loudly and they heard. Oh, that must be just so incredibly difficult and, and painful, right? Because the way that they're kind of described, it doesn't seem like they were together anymore, but they made a kid together. So clearly like there's some history. Yeah. And the kid saw his father. Yeah, exactly. So she also acknowledged Adam's struggle with mental illness and that it contributed to some of his troubles with the law. And she said that when he was doing good, he was a wonderful person, but she hadn't seen him in several months. She had heard from him on social media the Sunday before body parts started turning up. So again, body parts started showing up on a Thursday and she had talked to him the Sunday before. And he had messaged her on Instagram telling her he loved her and that he would talk to her ASAP. And she didn't respond to him at the time. That caught my attention. And again, we don't know their relationship. We don't know how frequently they talked or how often they messaged each other on social media. But the fact that he would say, I love you, we will talk right away. We need to talk or, you know, whatever words he did end up using. Sounds like he knew something was up or maybe he was in some sort of danger. Yeah. Because, I mean, isn't that like a last thing that people will do? If you know something might happen to you, the person that you care about, you say like, I love you. Yeah. Or something like that. But this poor family. Yeah. Hurts my heart. It really does. So there's a little bit more information about the case and some of the details. Dr. Michael Thompson, a forensic psychologist, said it's very mocking. So like Adam's head and where it was located, he believes that the killer was likely someone that Adam knew and that he was killed with, quote, extreme rage. Since the body parts were scattered in four public locations, Thompson also believes it's a sign that the killer wanted to dehumanize and mock Adam even in death. I feel like we are talking about a Criminal Minds episode, but this is real. Yeah, it's horrible. And just a quote from Dr. Thompson, too. The fact that the body parts were found in several different places, and at least we can infer that the head was posed, leads me to think that this was somebody that was somewhat organized, was not suffering from acute psychotic disturbance, but rather somebody that at least has the ability to reason out what they are doing. That's scary. Like, that makes it even scarier, I think. It does. It does. Because also, look, I've been mad before, like really really mad but this is like a whole nother level yeah and like if you could be this mad once you could be this mad again yeah exactly i would be scared if i lived in that area Mm -hmm. because also like you don't know what's going to set people off sometimes it's like road rage and we've seen that in some of the cases Mm -hmm. yeah exactly that flipping someone off can get you killed exactly so in many cases that include the dismemberment of a body The act is done to either like hide the body, conceal the crime, something along those lines. And that is not the case here. This was not just to help get rid of the body. It was literally putting on a show. So here's a little, I don't even want to say good news, but here's something. The body parts being scattered all over gives the police more opportunities to solve the crime. When he is basically making multiple crime scenes, right? Yes. It's going to give him more opportunity to slip up at some point, leave something 
accidentally. Yeah. It also means that he can get to these places easierly. You know, like he can get to these places with body parts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, hopefully, I mean, I don't think that they found everything yet. So maybe if he's still doing this, he's either going to get caught because now he's too confident, right? Like he's like, oh, I've done it. I've gotten away with it this many times. Exactly. Tomorrow when I do it, he's going to leave something accidentally behind because he's going to be in a rush or perhaps someone's going to walk by where he's not expecting it. He's just leaving himself open. I agree. So if anyone has any information, they're requesting that you leave a detailed tip with Crime Stoppers of Minnesota. John Elder, the one that we talked about doing the news conference, said even the smallest thing can help break a case. No tip is too small. So we're going to move on to updates to our cases we've already covered. And so the first one we're going to touch base on is the Taryn Summers and Connie Ann Smith case. And I wanted to just give a little bit of a recap because it's been a few months since we first covered this. So on our True Crime Digest number three that was released in the beginning of May, we talked about Taryn Summer and her siblings. So since September, of 2020, three siblings had gone missing from their legal guardian's home, which was their grandmother, Connie Ann Smith. Initial news articles didn't state whether the children were related, but they were siblings. And so the three children were Tristan, Taylor, and Taryn. And so Tristan was the oldest, 17, Taylor was 14, and Taryn was eight. Now, unfortunately, it was pretty soon after she was reported missing, Taryn's remains were found in the back of Connie Ann Smith's Lexus. And so there's currently charges pending against her. We feel like we've been kicking the can down the road a little bit because her preliminary hearing keeps getting pushed and pushed. It's been pushed again to August, but there's some terrible news that came out this month that is just heartbreaking. So this particular news, I haven't seen reported on any official news outlets, but we're in several groups for this case. And people who are close to the family have said that Taylor accidentally drowned the weekend of the 24th and that. I believe her brother was there and tried to help her and couldn't. Oh, gosh. So not only did they lose one sibling, now he's lost two. Yes, and he's the oldest, too. So it's like... Ugh. Yeah. Kids. It's disgusting and sad. And they don't suspect foul play. Like, it truly was an accident from everything I've heard, but just devastating. Awful. Yeah. I was hoping we'd have something good coming from at least Connie Ann Smith's case or, you know, moving along. But not this. Absolutely not. Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of talk like, are the children safe and this and that? And it's like, they were swimming together on the weekend in the summer and this terrible, awful thing happened. Awful. I feel so bad for Tristan. That's awful. Yeah. I, as like, I'm the baby and I can't imagine losing my brothers. I can't even imagine what it would feel like to be the oldest. And also, they're young. Like, you shouldn't be losing siblings at 17, right? No. It's bad no matter what age you are, but, like, they're just kids. Yeah. And he's had a rough start. Poor guy. Yeah. So... Our next update is an update on the Linda Stolzfus and Husto Smoker case. So we covered Linda in our True Crime Digest 3. She was an 18-year-old Amish girl from Lancaster, and she disappeared on her way home from church back in June of 2020. Husto Smoker was charged with her disappearance in July of 2020, and then in December, he was charged with her homicide. At that time, her body had not yet been found. Her body was not found until April of this year. As part of the plea deal, Smoker led authorities to Linda's body and confessed to kidnapping and murdering her. He buried Linda 42 inches below the ground behind his work. Heather Adams, Lancaster County's district attorney, said, quote, Knowing what we know now, we fully believe we would have never found her without his help. Husto has already done time for other crimes before and also violated parole. He did apologize to the family and he did plead guilty to third degree murder, kidnapping, abuse of a corpse, possession of an instrument of crime, and two counts of tampering with evidence. In exchange, they agreed to a sentence of 35 and a half to 71 years in a state correctional institution. He also faces an additional sentence of up to 17 and a half years by the state parole board. And now he may serve up to 88 years, which is effectively a life sentence. Jesus, but good. Well deserved. Yeah, he's trash. Absolutely. So now we're going to shift into our Lori Vallow Daybell and Chad Daybell updates. So there is both an immense amount and not as much this month. It was a weird month. In the same way. Yeah. Yeah. In an exciting note, they announced that they're going to be pursuing the death penalty. He definitely deserves it. He is human garbage. 
Absolutely. Lately, reading all of the details that are coming out, and like you said, like it's a lot of information, but also not necessarily either new information or it's just some extra added details to things that we might have already known or suspected. Mm -hmm. But just reading more and more about this case makes you absolutely despise this man even more. Very true. And obviously Lori Vallow. Like you absolutely hate her. So Chandler Police released 2,500 documents as part of Freedom of Information Acts requesting information. There's still a lot of redacted information. So you're reading it and then there's going to be a lot of like area that you still can't see. Again, this information is some of its new details, but not necessarily new, big, surprising details. Yeah. There is a, just a sweet picture of JJ, though, at Yellowstone Bear World. It just, like, breaks my heart that that might have been, like, one of the last times he had fun. Well, but also, like, in the photo, he looks sad because it was taken, like, a week after Tylee was murdered. So she's not there. There wasn't dates on it originally. So there's just the picture in one. And then later on, there's a conversation between two investigators. This was attached to an email from one officer to another that said the photo was taken on September 14th. And it raises more questions for me. Like, why were they going to Yellowstone so frequently? Were they trying to give JJ a good day? Was it just to get his mind off things? He's in like this little ride, but he's alone, which is kind of odd. Yeah. At the same time, you don't really see kids' rides not busy. Just to like set the scene, like it's a ride where there's like six seats all next to each other and he's sitting in like the center seat and there's no one on the other seats. It's very, very strange. Yeah. He doesn't look like he's having fun on the ride, right? Like he doesn't look like a kid on a ride. Yeah, exactly. So three days after Alex shot Charles, Alex booked a flight to Columbia. He went on the trip from July 14th to July 19th. How many times in a crime drama have you seen like the investigator roll up his sleeves and go and don't leave town? This guy left the country. I wonder if he was just wanting to be out of country in case they're like, hey, this wasn't self-defense. I mean, I'm sure it was, but the fact that he did leave the country. Yeah, it's wild. And it's easy for me to say as like an outsider looking into this case, right? But I hate how it was handled. I, I say it as an outsider, but also even if I was an insider, I feel like it was handled poorly. There's just so many things that just pointed to this guy he did not do it in self-defense. And then if you would have just ran with it early, children could be alive right now. Exactly. And Tammy. But I'm just like, in my head, I'm like, children, you messed up and children died. Yeah, exactly. Very angry about it. It's just, ugh. and every time I'm looking at JJ, I, I think it's because I have a son too. And I'm just like, my, my heart. And Tylee, right? Little teenage girl, like, why would you hurt her? Yeah. So many people's lives were lost because these assholes. By these assholes, I mean Chad and Laurie. Yeah. Well, and Alex. And Alex, yeah. Yeah. So police were looking into what he was doing. Like, why did you go to Columbia? July 15th through the 18th, he also wired money to someone three times. Bizarre. Again, these are weird details that you're like, why? And you have a lot of questions and you want to understand it, but also does it change your feelings on the case or what people were doing? Like, not necessarily. You still hate them. You probably just hate them more. It adds intrigue and it adds some color, but it doesn't change the broad strokes of the case, which is these children were murdered, Tammy was murdered, Charles was murdered. Yeah. There's just other wrinkles. So there's also text messages that were released. So text from Kay to Lori. And one is, I need a hug, kiss from JJ. And it was right after Charles died and they were talking about Charles's memorial ceremony. And Lori says that JJ isn't going to the memorial, that they are moving to Hawaii and ask where to send Charles ashes. Typical fucking Lori. Just no emotion. None at all. I understand if you guys were separated, but wouldn't you at least act better? You know, like, couldn't she have been a better actress here? I mean, look at her with Annie Cushing, right? That's true. She treated Annie Cushing very similarly, where she was like, what, you care that they're dead? Yeah. That's true. Completely oblivious. I just feel like she had this grand, elaborate plan, scheme, whatever you want to call it, that she would have just tried a little here because that's also, I'm sure, where some of the, huh, what is she up to came from? Because, you know, Kay is the center of this where she's like, I need answers. I need to find my grandchild. Like she started this investigation. She's the reason why we are here where we are today. But you couldn't even like, I don't know. It's just weird to me that she didn't think about trying a little bit, like trying to have a little bit of empathy trying to at least be kind to his family i don't know 
it's all of that that makes it not altogether surprising that police were surveilling Laurie and Alex and Chad. They were like, something is up with these guys. And I wonder, like, what terrible, what other things they would have done if given the opportunity. Seriously, I think this could have been the beginning of a lot more. I do too. So there's also some grainy photos of Chad and Lori. They had a surveillance video pointing at the Hawaii townhome for the entirety of their time in Hawaii. And there's photos of other people coming and going as well. And again, remember, if you go back, Lori at one point even went to Hawaii to talk to her friend trying to recruit her. Mm Mm-hmm. So I wonder who else in Hawaii or who else in Idaho or, you know, even Arizona. Yeah. There's probably players that either we've heard their name before or just some that we've never even heard of that are just out there with these beliefs running around. Well, hopefully they're hearing these beliefs being brought into the sunlight and going, oh, yeah, that does sound not great. So, continuing on, on August 8th, Adam's wife, and by the way, Adam, Laurie's brother, Adam's wife emailed police saying that she thinks that there's something strange going on with Charles's death. Also, weirdly, after JJ had disappeared, Alex was out shopping for a coat for Lori. And this little tidbit of information was found in an email trail where investigators were talking about how bizarre that was, right? Like, and I watched Nate Eaton kind of, he had like a overview of some of the documents and he was talking about, he's like, that's weird. I am close with my siblings and I don't go buy them coats. Like I don't buy my siblings coats. It's weird. I think I have bought my sister a coat before, but also she lives in cold Michigan and I think it was like a birthday present or something. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fair. But it was like, I would not send my brothers to go buy me a coat. Mm -mm. It just, it just would not happen. So as we've noted before, there are three pending cases against Laurie. So there's the obstruction, the destruction, and the murder case. As a note, there's two separate murder cases, one against Chad and one against Laurie. There weren't any new filings in the obstruction case. However, the destruction case was dismissed after Rob Wood filed a motion to dismiss without prejudice on July 28th. The following day on July 29th, Judge Boyce granted the motion to dismiss without prejudice. So switching over to the murder cases, we know that Missouri attorney Rachel Smith, who is known for expertise in capital murder cases, was granted pro hoc admission into the destruction case in March. Judge Boyce noted then that she would need to be admitted into each individual case. So on July 28th as well, Smith was granted pro hoc admission into the murder case. Also in Chad's murder case, John Pryor filed a motion for the grand jury transcript, which is exactly what it sounds like. So we're still combing through the documents as they're released. If we find anything that we think is life-changing, we'll make sure to share it. Otherwise, of course, we will talk about it in our next True Crime Digest. Yeah. And also, if there's like a substantial amount, we'll just do a full out Velo episode as opposed to tacking on to the bottom of the True Crime Digest. Oh, and also, Lindsay sent me an East Idaho News shirt. (laughs) It's amazing. (laughs) I think Nate Eaton posted a picture like, we sell t-shirts. And I was like, immediately. (laughs) Well, and when I got the package, it said from Nate Eaton. And I had forgot that Lindsay ordered something. She didn't tell me what she ordered. She just said, I'm ordering something. Yeah. And I'm like, why is Nate Eaton sending me a package? But also excited because (laughs) Nate Eaton sent you a package. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I was pretty stoked. Yeah. As always, too, if you have a case that you want us to cover, let us know. Email us. Tag us. Whatever you want to do is great. So we talked about in the beginning of the show. We're also going to go over for just a few minutes all of our Patreon offerings and tiers. Very exciting. First tier starts at only a dollar, and it's our mittens tier. And that gives you access to what Lindsay just talked about, the Bat Bonfire. That's our Patreon-only Facebook group where we interact with our listeners, talk about the cases, and also get ideas sometimes. So we just recently took an idea from the Bat Bonfire and turned it into an episode. That's true. We did. So our our next tier is our $5 tier, and it's a jump ghost. I love that name. And so with that, you get access to the Bat Bonfire. You also get a sticker when you join, and then every year on your Patreon anniversary month. Yep, and it's a new sticker. So if you already have a True Creep sticker, it'll be a different one. The next one is our Fire Yeti tier, and it's $8 per month. And that gives you access to the Bat Bonfire and an annual custom fall card for all the members that join by September 15th. We're in June. It's it's approaching, (laughs) and it'll be a really fun card. We're going to take a lot of different themes from our episodes and create something amazing. 
You also get a sticker when you join and then also the sticker every year on your Patreon anniversary. The last here is my absolute favorite name, obviously calling back to our second episode of Black Forest, which so many moons ago. But the Vortex Bouncer is $25 a month. You get all the goodies that we already talked about. Plus you get a t-shirt when you join and a t-shirt every year on your anniversary month, which will also be a different t-shirt. And also, speaking of t-shirts, if you head over to our website, truecreeps.com, and click merch, we have some really fun merch, including ones that say, I'm not a scientist, and I don't like it. (laughs) And you can get those designs on totes, bags, hoodies, baby onesies, all the things. So you can take a peek at that. And as a special note, we love our Patreons, and we so, so appreciate your support in the show. And we really do love you guys. We do. And I love our discussions. Yes, 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 yes. Have a good weekend. Thanks for creeping with us. Thanks for listening. For more information on our sources, please visit our website, truecreeps.com. If you'd like to follow us on social media, you can follow us on Instagram at truecreepspod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash truecreepspod, and on Twitter at truecreeps. We'd love for you to keep creeping with us. So if you like this episode, please subscribe, rate, review, and share the show with your fellow creeps. 